I want to go to the book of Jude. You know, sometimes I, I try to kind of, I guess, get ahead of God in my mind. I was thinking of when God told me to start the service that way, that I was thinking particular things would happen and certain things would happen and the service would turn out a certain way. But God knows what he wants to get across. God knows what needs to be delivered. God knows what each and every one of us needs and we have to be obedient to him. In the book of Jude, I want to read verse 3. The Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude wrote unto, unto the people that he was writing to back then that it was important for him, it was needful for him to write unto them that they should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. I believe if it was true then, it's even more true now that we have to earnestly contend for the faith. And what does that really mean? We have to sincerely, we have to honestly, and with everything that we got, we have got to contend for the faith. That faith was delivered unto us. It said that faith that was delivered unto the saints. It was delivered unto us, and we were given a charge to keep that faith. And we were given a charge to deliver that faith to the world. But there has come a time, and if you go on and you read in Jude, he said that he had to warn them about that because there were certain men who crept in and who had changed the grace of God, who had changed the message. And if it was true then, it's even more true now. There are those who have crept into the church. There are those who have come in and have changed everything that the word has to say. The Bible says in one place there will come a time when there will be a famine, not for bread and water, but for the hearing of the word of God. And I believe we are in that time. You might think, how can you say that? There's five, six, ten, maybe more uh, networks on TV that are dedicated just to so-called Christian programming. There are mega churches that are filled with thousands upon thousands of people. The word is going out. The word is going out all over the world through satellite and through everything else. The word is going out. How can I say that there's a famine for the hearing of the word? Well, if you listen to very much of this, if you listen to it for very long, you're going to find out that a lot of it is not that word. It has been changed. It has been rearranged. It has been added to it, has been taken away from. Man has got in there and put their interpretation on it. Man has got in there and put their spin on it. Man has got in there and changed it. The true, pure, unadulterated word of God is very seldom heard anymore. The true, pure, unadulterated word of God is getting scarcer and scarcer and scarcer. Why do you think there are so many versions of the Bible? All man-made versions. There's only one true version. There's only one true word of God. And that one is heard very little. That one is not very popular. You got all these guys that are making their own Bible. They put their name on a Bible. They're changing this and they're changing that. And we're in a place where there is a famine for the word of God. And I believe that's why God has sent this message. We are at a time where we need to earnestly contend for the faith that was delivered unto the saints. We are the saints of God. God, those who are born again. It's not just the people who have died in the Catholic state get to be called saint whoever from now on. It is those that God has cleansed, that God has purified, that God has made righteous. We are the saints, and he delivered something to the saints, and we have a responsibility to keep that faith, to keep that word, to make sure it goes out. And he said you had to earnestly contend for it. We are going to have to fight to keep this word. We are going to have to fight to keep it out there. Bob preached this morning about being a witness, being that fire, letting that fire burn through you. And we have to do that not only with the world nowadays, we've got to do it with the church. We have got to get the message to the church. That, that's the biggest missionary field I think there is in the United States of America is the so-called church because they have left the faith. They have walked away from the faith and we need to fight for it. We don't want to fight because we don't want to make waves. We don't want anybody mad at us. We don't want anybody to get upset. We all just want to get along. But what did you say here? You have to contend. What does it mean to contend? It means to fight. We need to stand up and we need to fight for this and for our God. 
and for the way that he said it has to be. We have to contend for the faith. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We get to a place where we'll just, and I use this phrase a lot, go along to get along. I preached last week that there are those who think that under grace you can do whatever you want to do and still make heaven your home. That's not according to the word of God and we need to stand up and proclaim loudly. Just as loudly as we need to proclaim to that one who's never been saved that you must be born again. We need to proclaim that those in the church who have been deceived, you must live it this way. We need to proclaim the gospel the way the gospel was given to us. This is the word of God. And if this is not what's in the church, then they are wrong. And they are walking the wrong path. And they are going in the wrong direction. And we need to earnestly contend. We need to fight for what is right. We need to stand up and let them know that this is the way it has to be. No other way will get you into heaven. I am scared for the church in America. I am scared for a lot of people I know. I said it when I preached last week. My heart is heavy. There are good people, sincere people, who have been deceived and been lulled into some false gospel. And why is it? It's because the true Christian hasn't stood up and proclaimed, this is the way. We said, no, you go ahead and believe that, and I'll go ahead and believe this, and we'll just get along with one another. As long as you believe you must be born again, then we're all okay. Right. That's not true. Come on. We have got to give them the whole gospel, Amen. the whole truth, whether they like it or whether they don't. Just like Cindy said, her grandson didn't want to hear it, but she had to tell it. They don't want to hear it, but we got to tell them because we have been charged by God that we have to tell them. He said to you, you are the saints of God. He said, I have delivered this thing unto you. I've gone back to my father. I've placed it in your hands, and now you've got to fight for it. We don't want to be disliked. We don't want to be pointed at. We don't want to be laughed at. We don't want to be talked about. We don't want to be shunned. We don't want none of these other things to happen. So we just let things go and we keep our mouth shut. What would have happened if Christ would have acted like that? The religious system did not like him. And if you're living this and you're proclaiming this, they're not going to like you either. He said they hated me and they're going to hate you. And he wasn't talking about the lost people. He was talking about the church. Amen. And they will. They'll dislike you. They'll talk about you. They'll point at you. They'll laugh at you. They'll call you names. They'll tell you you don't know what you're talking about. But you've got to proclaim the gospel. You've got to earnestly contend for the faith that was delivered to you. I don't know if we know how serious that is. I'm going to say it again. He went back to the Father. But when he left, I said, he said, I'm giving this to you. It's in your hands now. You have got to do what I have been doing. I gave you the example. I showed you the way. I showed you and told you hey, and gave you everything you need to do. Now I'm giving it to you and you have got to go out there and you have got to give it. Who did he go and tell? He went to the lost. He went to those who were down. He went to those who were sick. But who did he get on the most? The religious system. Because it was the religious system that was deceiving good-hearted people. It was the religious system that was deceiving decent people, sincere people, people who were truly searching. The religious system was messing them up. What did Jesus say to them? They're blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. Many people are following the blind religious system and they're going to end up in the ditch unless we help them out, unless we give them the truth, unless we earnestly contend for the faith. Whether they like it or whether they don't like it, we have got a job to do. I know there's been many, many, many messages that God has had me to preach. And he has me to preach against the religious system, against the so-called church. Maybe that's the duty. Maybe that's the job of this little church. Maybe that's our calling. I don't know. Maybe that's where we're going to end up. Maybe we're going to have to go out there. And that's where we're going to have to contend with the religious system. 
system that is leading our brothers and our aunts and our uncles and our moms and our dads and our grandchildren. They're leading them into the ditch. Maybe we need to go out there and we need to contend with them and tell them what the truth is. Right. We can't just keep letting it go and say, well, you believe in God and I believe in God so we can all get along. Come on. It's not true. The Sadducees and the Pharisees believed in God. But what did Jesus say to them? They were full of dead man's bones. He called them vipers. He called them snakes. Read all the things that he said about the religious system. He didn't say, you believe in God and I believe in God so we can just get along. I'm going to tell you something. What we experience in this place when the presence of God comes, that is church. <coughs> that is what God intended church to be. Mm -hmm. What you got out there that pretends to be church, you got smoke and you got lasers and you got noise and you got coffee shops and you got selling this and you got selling that and, and everything and the focus is everywhere except on God. If it's not on God, if the focus is not entirely on God, Bob said it several times this morning, it's been said here a lot, it's not about the building, it's not about the preacher, it's not about the people, it's about God. Amen. And if anybody who proclaims to be church has not got God at the top, they are not the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we need to let them know. Right. And they're going to say well, who do you think you are coming in here and telling us we are not this and we're not that? And I, I'm going to tell them who I am. I am a child of the living God. I have been called to proclaim a message. I have been handed the faith and charged to keep the faith. I have been charged to earnestly contend for the faith because it was delivered to me. And I have a responsibility and I have a duty to fight for it. The church quit fighting somewhere back down the road. We just give up like a bunch of little bunnies and go in our holes on Sunday morning and sit in our pews and then we scamper off. Mm -hmm. The battle's out there. Right. The fight's out there. Mm -hmm. Where we're going to win then is out there. I don't see any walls here tonight. Mm -hmm. We can't win them right. in here if they're not here. Mm -hmm. I don't see any that have think they're Christians, who think they're all right, who think they're going the right way, but they have been deceived. I don't see any of them in here. They're out there. And we have got to go out there. And just like Bob said this morning, we have got to stand up and burn with a fire that they can see. Amen. I think a lot of time, just like, like was said, we want to put our candle under a bushel. We'll pull it off when we come through that door back there so all the brothers and sisters see how spiritual we are and how full of the Holy Ghost we are and how much we worship and how happy we get. But as soon as we get out there and get in our car, we get the basket back out. And we go through our week like that. You should be out there what you are in here. Amen. Everywhere you go, whoever you come in contact with, you should be out there what you are in here. I know it's easy in here because the presence of God is so overwhelming in here and you're with people of a like mind and it makes it a whole lot easier. But I'm going to tell you something. If you trust, if you believe, if you take to heart what I read earlier that everywhere you go, God is with you. God, is, what did I read to you? He is with us and he is a refuge. I'm going to tell you something. You have somebody of a like mind with you out there. You may it'll be easy out there because he thinks the same way you do. He will be there with you. And when it gets too hard, just like we talk, he's a refuge you can step into and regain your strength and step back out and fight on. The church needs help. Not the true church. But what we call the church needs help. Somebody's got to do the job. Jesus went back to heaven. He left the job with us. He's not going to come back and go through what he went through and do it all again and take care of it. He left the job with us. Again, I don't know if we understand how, how crucial that is and how important it is and how serious it is that he said he has delivered that unto us. 
and we are responsible for it. We have got to do it. If we don't do it, it's not going to get done. They're just going to keep on going the way they're going, going through the motions, through the tradition, through the show, through whatever else they do, and end up in hell. That's what's going to happen unless they get the truth. I'm going to tell you, I said about the one saved, always say thing. That's just one of the multitude of things out there deceiving people. There are those who will say, you turn on some of these 6, 10, 15, how many ever religious broadcasting networks they got out there. I bet you 99.9% .9 of them, at the end of the program, they say, if you want to be saved, say this prayer. Mm -hmm. Everybody sitting at home says it and thinks they're going to heaven. That's not true. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to let them know because they're being deceived. They're the blind following the blind. And they're going to end up in the ditch unless somebody tells them the truth. Amen. Right. And there are those out there who think, I was baptized as a baby, so I'm going to heaven. There are those out there who think, I signed the church roll, so I'm going to heaven. There are those out there who think, I did this number of good works, so I'm going to heaven. It's on and on and on and on and on and on. Hundreds and thousands of different things that Satan has brought in to pass for the gospel, which is not the gospel. He's brought it into the so-called church and fed it to the people, and the people have eaten it, and they believe that they're all right. And somebody's got to tell them. Preach it. I believe, as it was in the beginning of the church, it's going to be in the end of the church. There were very few, and they were bucking the system, and the government was against them, and the church was against them, but they did it back down. They stood up and told them what they were. John the Baptist looked at them and said to them, you generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He told them like it was. That was the church people he was talking to, and we need to be the same way. I'm not telling you go out there and stir up trouble i'm not telling you go out there and cause problems i'm telling you go out there and proclaim the gospel amen. of jesus christ amen. it'll stir up the trouble amen. it'll make the problems amen all you've got to do is give them the word mm -hmm. right. that'll do it that's all that it takes but as i said i believe it's going to be in the end as it was in the beginning i believe as it was when the church started in the book of acts it's going to be in the end there were very few of them who knew the truth who were in the right way who were truly a part of the church of jesus christ and we're getting fewer and we're getting fewer and we're getting fewer that are in the true church and i believe it's going to be just like it was then we're going to have to stand up to the system the religious system the governmental system the judicial system all this systems of man, we're going to have to stand up against them and loudly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many of the converts in the early church came out of the religious system. They can be saved if they're given the truth. Many of those people were in there because they had been deceived. The scribes and the Pharisees had deceived them and told them, if you keep all these traditions, if you do all these things, if you do what we say and act how we say and just go through all the stuff that we tell you to do, you're all right. They were deceived until they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's many out there like that today in the so-called church that are deceived because they have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to read you something else. In the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 1, Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done for the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together in the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, Sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. Also they have shut up the doors of the porch, and put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment and to hissing, as ye see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. 
Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. And you may say, what in the world does that have to do with what you're talking about? They did exactly what the United States of America has done. Our fathers turned away from God. Our fathers brought filthiness into the house of God. Our fathers polluted the house of God. You go back through time. And you go back to the founding of this country. That it was founded on the holiness. That was founded on the word. That was founded on righteousness. And it wasn't too very long that they started creeping in. And they started coming in. And from that time forward, our forefathers have changed the word of God. They have changed the gospel of God. They have brought in all kinds of filthiness. They have brought in all kinds of problems. And that's why we are where we are as a nation today. It's because of the church. That's the problem. That's where the problem stemmed from. It's not because their fathers did it. They were carried into captivity. People were killed. Their sons and their daughters are held captive. We got the same thing going on. Spiritually speaking, our sons and our daughters are held captive by Satan. Our, our families, our loved ones, our friends, our acquaintances, they're spiritually dying. They're being taken captive by Satan because we have allowed filth to come into the church. We have not stood up against it. You don't got to go too very far from here and walk into some of these buildings that are called church and you're going to see exactly what he was talking about there. Amen. Don't think it ain't so. It is so. Satan is in a lot of these places. Amen. It may look nice. It may have crosses on the wall and pictures of Jesus on the wall and a steeple and a bell and a sign that says church. But Satan is in there. Amen. Unless it is 100% this word. Unless it is 100% God, directed by the Holy Spirit of God, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, unless it is those things, it is not the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we, this is the part that God really pointed out to me. Be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him and to serve him. He has chosen you. He has called you out. You have a job. You have a purpose. And I don't know if this is your only purpose, but I know this is one of your purposes. Otherwise, this message wouldn't be coming. you got a purpose. you got a job to warn them, to give them the truth, to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ, to get those who are following the blind leaders out of that mess out of that situation to set those captives free that Satan has taken before it is too late for them. We have got to clean up the church. Amen. We have got to do it. The children of God are the only ones who can do it. He called the priests and the Levites. They are the ones who had to do it. We are the ones who have to do it. What did Peter say you are? You are priests. He said you are a royal priesthood. You're the ones that's got to do it. You have got to clean up the church. They had to go in there and clean it out. You know what they did first? I think I preached this here before. They fixed the door first. Why? So a lot of stuff couldn't get in. We need to fix the door of the church and keep Satan out. The doors are just hanging on their hinges. He comes and goes as he pleases. He does whatever he wants to do. I'm going to tell you something. We got a bouncer back there at that door. His name's the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And Satan ain't going to come in here and start no stuff because he can't get by him. The problem in a lot of places that call themselves church, they don't got a bouncer at the door. You ever see on TV or on a commercial or something at these fancy clubs or whatever, they got a guy out back and they got a rope across and you got to come up and see if your name's on the list before you can get in the door. It's the same thing here. And Satan's name ain't on the list. He can't get in the door. <coughs> but he's getting in a lot of doors. And I truly believe that God is calling a people, not just us. We're not the only Christians in the world. It's not all about us. He has other Christians other places. And I believe he's calling all of us. 
to stand up and to contend for the faith. I'm going to tell you something, and you can judge me if you want to, but I get extremely angry. Maybe I'm not supposed to get angry, but I get extremely angry when they take and they call some of that mess church because that's a reflection on my God. I get extremely angry when they take and they call some of that stuff the gospel because that's a bad reflection on my God. I get extremely angry when they go out there and they proclaim to be a child of God and they act like the devil himself because that's a reflection on my God. It is time that we got angry enough that we stood up and that we said something about it. You probably make more enemies than friends. But you got a friend that's thick as closer than a brother. Amen. Listen to this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel. And his fierce wrath and eternal way. His wrath, I, I started to say some of this about this country. His wrath is on this country. Oh, yeah. His wrath is on this country. But what did the guy say here? He says, in my heart to make a covenant with God that his wrath may turn away. If we can make a difference, if we can reach some of them, if we can turn them to God, and if we can show them the truth, deliver them from deception, it is possible that some of the wrath of God will turn away or maybe it will be abated for a little while because my Bible says that God hears the prayers of his children. God will listen. God, I believe we've only gotten this far because of the prayers of the saints. I believe had it not been for the prayers of the saints, we had already either be speaking Chinese or German or something else, but because of the prayers of the saints, God has allowed us to go this far. If we stand up and we fight and we proclaim the gospel, maybe we'll get a little more time to reach our lost loved ones, to bring them in that have been deceived. But we've got to do what the king did here, what Hezekiah did here. He says, in my heart to make a covenant with God so that his wrath may turn away from us. And then he went on, he said, be not negligent for the Lord hath chosen you to do it. You, the children of God. It was the people of God who had to go in and clean it up. The pigs ain't going to clean out their own pen. That's right. They'll just roll around in it. They like it. They just have a good old time rolling around and rooting and doing all that stuff. They ain't going to clean out their pen. Somebody else has to come and do it. That's our job. And again, I want to make this extremely clear. I'm not telling you to go out there and start trouble and stir up trouble and do all that stuff. I'm not telling you next Sunday to go down the road and kick open at somebody's church door and go marching in there and tell them what a bunch of heathens they are. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you to stand. When God gives you the opportunity, you stand. When you, when you speak with someone who is in this, this way, give them the word of God. Don't back down. Don't say you're all right because one time you said a prayer, we can all just get along and go on and be happy. Tell them the truth. Stand for the truth of God, for the word of God. It was delivered unto you, and you are responsible for it. It was delivered unto you, and you've got a job to do. You have got to be the one who does it. Because like I said, they're not going to do it themselves. The pigs don't clean out their own pen. We have got to do it. And I truly believe, and I'm going to say again, I'm almost done. I'm going to say this again. I believe everybody sitting here, you heard this message because it's one of your jobs. God wouldn't have sent the message if it wasn't for you to hear. He knew each and every one of you that was going to be here tonight. You may think you're here because you wanted to be here. You're here because God wanted you here. You're here because God wanted you to hear this message. God wanted you to hear this message because God wants you to do something with this message. Maybe you're going to come in contact with somebody this week, next week. Maybe you have a relative. I got relatives that are in what I call false religion, and I've got to tell them the truth. I don't like them being mad at me. I don't like them being upset with me. I want to be able to get along with them. But more than that, I don't want them to go to hell. I have got to give them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if they get mad at me, I, then I just got to take that. Christ had to deal with the very same thing. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And we're going to have to deal with the very same thing. But we have got to give them the truth. Amen. I know it's hard. But God will give you the strength to do it. God will enable you to do it. 
And as I said, as I read to you here, when King Hezekiah come in, for years before, they had been a mess. Their forefathers before them had turned away from God. The sanctuary was polluted. The doors were off the hinges. All these other things were going on. He was just a young man. He didn't know a lot. He, he wasn't... It, that it says anybody with any great intelligence like Solomon or anything like that. But what he had was a heart for God. And that's all you got to have. And because he had a heart for God, he saw the problem. And he stood up and he did something about the problem. And that's what God is calling us to do. If we have a heart for God, we have got to defend our God. We have got to defend the gospel. We have got to earnestly contend for the faith that was delivered unto us. Hezekiah came there and it said right away in the first year of his reign he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and he started cleaning it up it's been said here in different ways over the last few months about this I want you to get this God has put something together here. We are beginning something new. This is not the same old Jefferson Church. This is not the same old status quo. This is not what it has been for over the years. God is building something new here. He said, I will do a new thing. And he's doing a new thing here. Just like he brought in a new king to clean up his house. He is doing a new thing here. And this new thing has a purpose. That king had a purpose to clean up the house of God, to bring God back into that sanctuary to bring God back into that place and the new thing that he's doing here he is raising up a new thing to bring God back to this community to bring God back to Jefferson to bring God back to Spring Grove to bring God back to Glen Rock to West York to wherever else that we can reach out this is a new thing that God is going to do and he said I have chosen you and I just remember, I preached that a couple times, that God has chosen you. He keeps saying it. He keeps saying it. He has chosen us for a purpose, for a reason. we got to get ready. We've got to get strong. We have got to get courage. We have got to get a backbone. We have got to get filled with the Spirit. We have got to have that fire that Bob preached about this morning where he said he will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Let me ask you something. You answer for yourself. I heard this today. I don't even know who said it. I think I just heard it in the past. I'm walking by the TV. Was there a time in your life when you were more excited about Jesus than you are right now? Was there a time in your life when you were more in love with Jesus than you are right now? Was there a time in your life when you just couldn't contain it? But you're not that way now. We should be going this way, not this way. We need to get back here. We need, I think the guy was talking about revival. Maybe that's what we need. I'm not talking about a week of meetings. I'm not talking about calling up a preacher from somewhere else. I'm not talking about inviting all the other churches. I'm talking about a revival in your own heart. Amen. That's where the revival has to be. Right. And it has to come from God. And where does it come? How does he send it? Just like Bob preached this morning. He said, I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. We need to be like we once were. I can honestly say, and I hate to have to admit it, I'm not as pumped, I'm not as excited, I'm not as on fire as I once was. We let the world wear us down, Man. and we don't do anything about it. Man. We need to do something about it. We need to get on fire. We need to get excited. We need to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with everything that we are. We need to give it all to Him so that we are that burning bush. So that them standing over there saying, something's burning over there. I've got to go see what it is. If we get full of the Holy Ghost, that will happen. I don't know how many times I've preached this. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. If he's lifted up, he will draw them in. They will come. That's the word of God. He does not, cannot, will not lie. If he said it, it is so. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw them in. Obviously, we're not lifting him high enough because I don't see him coming in. Right. We need to lift him up. We need to build a fire. Bob talked about a brush fire. 
and it gets so hot, you can't even get close to it or it'll send you. That's the kind of fire we need to build here. Amen. We need a fire that's so hot, when they even get close, they're going to feel it. Amen. When they're driving by, they're going to feel it. When they're driving that road up there, they're going to feel it. When they're down there in the circle in Jefferson, they're going to feel it. Don't tell me it can't happen. Don't tell me it's wishful thinking. Don't think that's some kind of fairy tale. I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit can reach Amen. mile after mile after mile. He has no limit. And if we lift him up, if we build that fire, he will reach out. Amen. Amen. But it's got to start here. All of this. Everything. Everything that I believe God is building. Everything that I believe God is calling us to. Everything that I believe he wants to do. The vision he has given me. What I see in the future for this church. It has to start here. Amen. Not just in the pastor's heart. I'm talking about all y'all. Right. It's got to start there. If we stoke the flame there, if we build the fire there, and every one of us has got our fire stoked, what happens if you take a burning log and a burning log and you put them together? The flame gets bigger. What if every one of us gets on fire right. and we all come together right. and we have that roaring flame, that big fire, right. that one that they can't get close to without beginning to feel something from it, without it beginning to singe the sin that's in them. That's exactly what can happen. That's exactly what will happen. And I'm going to say this one more time. Don't think it can't. My God can do anything. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit. You read incidents after incidents after incidents in the Bible. You can find people today who can testify to the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Over a mile, over a mile, I think of Philip. The Holy Spirit sent him to preach to the eunuch. He got done preaching to the eunuch, and he was gone. The Holy Spirit just carried him to a whole other place. Don't think things like that can't happen. Because you have seen it in your lifetime. Because you haven't experienced it in your lifetime. Don't think he's any different than he was in there. Amen. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And I know a lot of time when I get up here and preach, I end up preaching about the Holy Ghost. But he is the one with whom we have to do. Amen. I know there are a lot of people. When you talk about the Holy Ghost, they think you want to go all Pentecostal. You want to do crazy things and roll on the floor and stuff like that. You can't be a child of God without the Holy Ghost. That's right. Amen. You can't have no power in God without the Holy Ghost. That's right. Amen. You can't live in this world as a Christian without the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's right. He is the one that Jesus sent back. He is the one who teaches us, who leads us, who guides us, who brings things to our remembrance, who comforts us, who gives us the power to be a witness or to do whatever job he has given us to do. It is all the Holy Ghost. It's time to let him back in the church. Amen. That's right. He's been kicked out of a whole lot of churches. As soon as you start talking about the Holy Ghost, they think you're crazy. But we need Him. Amen. We need Amen. His power. We need His fire. It's the only way that we can make a difference. It's the only way that we can get this message out there. I can go out there and tell them the scriptures. I can go out there and talk real good to them and give them a fancy speech and, and try to convince them of things and, and all this stuff. But if the power of the Holy Spirit is not in it, it's not going to change their heart. Right. It's not going to convict them. Right. It's only the Holy Spirit that can do that. You can be the best talker in the world. You can memorize the Bible from front to back. You can be eloquent. You can know all the right things to say. But without the Spirit, it does nothing. Amen. That's it. It's the Spirit. And we, this group, I know He has chosen us for a job, for a purpose, for a mission. We have something to do. As I said, I think He is doing a new thing. And that new thing, like that new king, had to come in and clean up the temple. He's going to do a new thing here. And we've got some cleaning to do. We've got some cleaning to do in our own lives. 
There may be things that we've done here, said here, or not doing here that we should do, whatever. We need to examine ourselves, clean ourselves, do what we need to do, get this place in the place that God would have it to be, and come together and revive our hearts and get that fire burn it. And when we come together and build that big fire, then we can work out there. I believe everybody in here is a child of God. I don't know your heart, but I see your fruit. I believe everybody in here is a child of God. I believe you love the Lord, and I believe you're sincere. I believe that from the bottom of my heart, but I don't believe we're where God wants us yet. That's right. I believe every one of us can move up. I believe every one of us can get stronger. I believe every one of us can throw another log on the fire. I believe every one of us has things that we can lay down and things that we can pick up. I believe there are changes that we can make that will give us more power with God, that will make us a better witness, that will make us a better life. I believe every one of us can do things to get to where God wants us to do. And I believe he's calling us to do that. But it's got to be an individual decision. It's like I said, it starts here. That's where the revival comes. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. God has convicted me while I was preaching. I'm not what I once was. I'm not as excited as I once was. I'm not as pumped up as I once was. I want to go back there. And God said I can go back there. And I'm going back there because he already said I could. So that's where I'm going. Every one of us can get back there. Don't you miss that. That... that feeling of closeness and that feeling of power and the Holy Spirit controlling everything and directing everything. Every one of us can have that every hour of every day. We don't have to be satisfied just to feel a little touch on Sunday. We don't have to be satisfied just to come in here and get a little something once a week. We can have it every day of our lives, 24 hours a day, if we just get revived in our own hearts. I didn't read it all there. If you go back there and you read what Hezekiah said to all of them, he said to them priests, sanctify yourselves. He didn't say, have God sanctify you. He didn't say, God will sanctify you. He didn't say anything like that. He said, sanctify yourself. There are things that you have to do that God has told you and you need to do them. God ain't going to do them for you if he told you to do them. God ain't going to come down and force anything. If you want to hang on to it, he'll let you hang on to it. If you don't want to do what he asked you to do, he ain't going to make you do what, you, what he asked you to do. You have got to make that decision and do it for yourself. Just like Hezekiah told those priests and those Levites, you, you go sanctify yourself until you sanctify yourself you can't sanctify the house of God Amen. until we get where God wants us until we're revived in our hearts we can't do nothing for anybody else we've got to get there that's all I got